Okay, before introducing the fourth speaker in the series, I'll give a short introduction to reconstructing her practice. Um, those of you that were at the Dianagrist lecture, I don't know, you've heard this already, so my apologies. In many debates that situate themselves on politically volatile ground, the central thread often becomes lost. In the debate surrounding the question of gender and how it is inscribed in certain cultural bodies, the central thread, a discussion about difference, has in many ways become victim of its context and got lost in its own story, and then somehow become taboo. I would therefore like to make a start by divorcing this discussion from the context of feminism or not feminism or not not feminism, and try to listen afresh, to return to the proper territory with code book in hand to the realm of the professional, to whom their practice is so important that they actually name the place they do it in after it. The lawyer, the doctor, the dentist, psychoanalyst, and the architect. Ironic, as in the last case at least, I know much of this practice is in fact done outside of this space. In private spaces, it's done in those spaces between our public and private lives, and in the spaces of other disciplines, the lecture room, the editing suite, the workshop, the stage, and the dark room. So perhaps this activity place hybrid of practice needs critical redefinition. Perhaps it is not so controlled, so separable from the life, the politics, and dare I say it, the body of the practitioner, who after all is a professional, is she not? <coughs> I'm interested in the nature of critical architectural practice, supplementary to conventional practice, in which critical distance is generated by gender difference. In Plato's Symposium, the nature of love and eros is discussed. As recounted by Apollodorus, seven men after dining debate through the night. The love in question here is male and homosexual. The highest form, as distinct from the heterosexual aspect of mere procreation. The domain is exclusive. The debate, the debate though by and about men, is intended to represent the higher aspirations of society as a whole. By the early hours of morning, all but Socrates has spoken, and little has been resolved. The company turned to Socrates, who in turn introduces an outsider to the discussion, Diotima, absent and female, and he recounts her understanding of Eros. What is significant here is not Diotima's gender, but her relative gender, that she is an outsider, both outside the all-male gathering and outside the topic of discussion, male homosexual love. Yet she's also obviously an insider. She's in a position to see things otherwise, and the conversation reaches some kind of new resolution under her illumination. To adopt a critical position puts one in a liminal condition. One must be both an insider and an outsider. An architect that is a woman, by combination of her gender and profession, is potentially in such a position. Insider by her education, her adoption by and off certain professional institutions, outside of by her difference. Her gender-related experience contains grounds for a resistive reading of certain architectural operations. She is able, almost obliged, to reconstruct her practice and to do so critically, to challenge accepted aspects of our built and unbuilt environment. A brief sent out to each of the contributors, his speakers, asked them to examine their work and working processes in response to this thesis, to articulate a critical dimension in the way they work. Emphasis was placed on practice and on the related question of the constructed gap between theory and practice, so manifest in architectural media and discourse. Though the critical position here is located by gender, its voice cannot be appointed as representing the feminine. To do so would be to territorialize it and to subscribe to the very categories it might desire to subvert. Feminine describes those attributes assigned to females by a patriarchal discourse and belongs to the masculine-feminine device, a stable construct within a stable discourse. Any discourse or operation critical of this is by implication unstable and subjective. Our subjective experience is gender-related and is potential grounds for a critical examination of the objective status quo, and I use objective ironically there. So gender here describes a critical position rather than a critical attitude. The selection of architects from Europe and the United States represents a range of architectural disciplines and critical positions. The intention is not to set out a new stereotype for architects or for women, but to identify 
a variety of critical routes into and out of the architectural mainstream. Well, that was the theory. This is the practice. The selection of architects was very difficult. Though emphasis was on critical practice, there is no set of rules or categories that includes these architects and excludes all others. The list that's made up the series evolved around trying to bring together architects and projects that in their juxtaposition would reveal more and would provide insights into each other. The thesis and questions made up a brief, which at times acted as a brief and at other times simply as a common starting point or a catalyst. Divergence from the brief was, as in all briefs in practice, both discouraged and quietly encouraged. The questions intended to address the extraordinary lack of debate around the absence of women from a discipline that, if it is to be read as a cultural construct, can be read as a physical manifestation of the very order which has up to recent years excluded them. Having situated myself from what I thought was quite proper territory, that of practice and the professional, I soon discovered there's something quite improper about this project. To, to steal again a term that really belongs to or is proper to Catherine Ingram. It is, I've discovered, improper to combine in one book architects that primarily practice as theoreticians with architects that primarily practice as builders and present them an equal or an equivalent relationship. Though builders and theorists often cohabit books, the theorist is usually theorizing about the builder's buildings a proper relationship where it is made quite clear who we are to take more seriously. This improper aspect of the project here has been the source of much fidgeting and wriggling by all involved, myself included. There's something uncomfortable about it. It meets with resistance at every step. It's hard to construct, to design, to market. It sticks decidedly in the throat, which begs the question why and why do it this way? Well, I won't begin to try and answer the first question but the latter is easier to answer. In editing this book, I'm trying in a token and lengthy way to do what I'm further asking each contributor to do, to breach in their redefinition of practice the related or implicated question of theory and practice, this implicated relationship, and to address how they resolve it or it resolves them. I use the word implicated here with quite specific intentions. Contained in this term is an already present division. It takes two or more to implicate. The term imbrication refers to the system of overlapping or apparent overlapping as used in the laying of tiles on a roof. In other words, identical elements that can be laid in different and overlapping relationships to each other, exchangeable elements, though any process of exchange might require rotation or inversion. By describing the relationship between theory and practice as imbricated, I'm inferring a desire to present them as one, as the as one and the same, one a flip side of the other. In the construction of the brief, the book, and the lecture series, I'm treating the contributors and their pieces as equivalent, though some operate in territories that are constructed as representing practice, and some as theory. It is, as in an imbricated surface, the way in which the pieces are laid down, their relationship to each other that remains crucial. As Jonathan Culler points out, a similar double division exists in much feminist criticism, which, even in its most theoretical moments, can't help referring to real experience, and through this to the authority of the experience of a female reader. To referring to such authority as do many architectural theorists, who even in their most abstract moments will suddenly return to the built, the unquestionably architectural, and then continue on with renewed confidence that it is all about architecture after all. Faced with the dilemma that not all women are female readers, the experience feminist criticism must refer to is of a hypothetical nature and the subject a hypothetical female reader, a construct that is neither wholly theoretical nor wholly real, that has its roots in both theory and real experience. So the relationship between theory and practice in feminist criticism remains switching, the two underpin each other. It is about a reading by a hypothetical female, a theoretical body who can refer to in exchange real or deferred experience with theoretical constructs who can hopefully, in her reading, make other readers, gender apart, start to question the cultural and political assumptions on which their readings have been based. With that said, I'd like to thank Mark Cousins for inviting this project here, and of course Elizabeth Diller for coming to lecture. And I take it by the packed auditorium that she doesn't need much introduction, so please welcome Elizabeth Diller.
Thank you, Francesca, and uh, thank you for inviting me to be part of the series, and I, I thank the AA for hosting it. Um, there is actually one thing that, uh, that, that needs to be said. Um, I don't know if all of you are familiar with me, but um, the work that I'll show you is, is a product uh, of a collaborative effort uh, with my partner, Ricardo Scofidio. And um, working in collaboration is actually a, a quite a complicated thing. Um, there is quite a bit of resistance uh, to, to this other category of a double collaboration, and um, because the world likes to see things authored by one person. So when it's authored by two, often um, it, it becomes neglected. Um, okay, I'd like to um, maybe get started with the projector. Um, I'm going to show you three uh, very modest projects. And I say modest, I mean, I've been shamed today because two of my buddies that are on the faculty here have told me that they're working on the design of cities and big urban things. And so these projects are absolutely minuscule. Um, but <coughs> they uh, very much represent, um, and they're also kind of pretentious for their size, actually, I should add. Um, but uh, they, all, they all deal with an issue that um, is quite important to us, and, um, uh, and that is c what I would call contractual space. Um, and, and that is the, um, the sets of encoded relations between bodies and programs um, which uh, exist in advance of architecture. So it's our concern that, uh, that those, um, those encoded relations are read very carefully uh, before architect architecture starts to play. So now I've been warned also that, um, that these controls can make you or break you around here. So <laughs> just about to. Uh -uh. <laughs> and I, I'm not even touching it. Looking through northeast window from third floor, excerpt. The Venetian blinds are half drawn. Every morning she prepares his breakfast, wearing a patterned house robe. Sitting at the kitchen table, his, his tie is perfectly knotted and draped over the back of his shoulder. She cleans up after his morning meal and sits down with coffee and a cigarette. Her eyes are riveted to a spot on the far wall. She doesn't look up when he leaves, but almost immediately approaches the window, being careful not to get too close. She watches him exit the building and walk up the street. Then she retreats from view. When she reappears, she's made up. Hair, cosmetics, and a long silky robe. At the same time every day, a man arrives, young, blonde, with a receding hairline. He wears navy blue coveralls with a bright yellow insignia on his left breast pocket. Large circular stains are visible under the arms of his uniform and on his lower back. It's the same routine every day. Her robe drops, she unzips the front of his coveralls, slips down his body and vanishes from sight. He soon disappears from view. They reappear in another window, traversing the apartment in a tangled frenzy, a random course that lasts an hour or so. By one o'clock, he's gone. She changes and begins her daily chores, the same routine like clockwork, dusting, cleaning, dishes, vacuuming. She exercises as she cleans. Repetitive movements, leg raises, first one leg, then the other, 10 reps each, then her arms. When she passes the westernmost window, her movements are illuminated by a flickering blue glow. Loophole was an installation in the second artillery armory of Chicago, the future site for a new building by Joseph Kleihus for the Museum of Contemporary Art. At the time of this project, the armory was a proxy site a site of intermission between programs, between jurisdictions, partially expired, partially on loan, and awaiting a demolition. It was occupied by the military personnel as well as museum staff. 
In an era which valorizes military over cultural achievement, this military site, in an ironic twist of fate, is in the process of yielding to a cultural program. Although the armory, armory type appears to be exhausted as a symbol of military maintenance over civic order, the riots following the Rodney King verdict in Los Angeles confirmed that the federal policing of internal unrest has not changed significantly since the inception of the armory program in the 19th century. From an architectural viewpoint, American armories hold a distinct place in the changing representation of the military. Built late in the lineage of the armory type, <clears throat> the second artillery armory made few medieval allusions, unlike its predecessors. The massive masonry structure, however, still presented a formidable image of authority. In the 70 years since its construction, the representation of military power has shifted progressively away from architecture, corresponding to the general crisis over architecture's questionable, questionable ability to speak effectively in a teletechnological world. The image of military authority formerly expressed through the, through the symbolic languages of architecture has found a new ephemeral expression played out within and performed specifically for the media, like the Gulf War. This revised image of military authority, which finds its domestic audience a captive one, is represented by smart technologies which, contrary to architectural representation, strive to create an image of the invisible, the undetectable, and the stealth. The Chicago Armory has two nearly identical stair towers which are toward the bottom of the image uh, at 45 degree angles. And um, they're symmetrically reflected to the north and south sides of the building. And our two-part installation occupied uh, both of these towers. Each stair was used as a narrative device to be read while ascending and de descending the stairs. And this is one and the other. A three-story fluorescent tube pinned the stairs radial geometry in plan and video cameras along this line could pivot to encompass a 65 degree optical wedge made up of concentric zones of surveillance uh, which progress in scale. So starting from um, the stairway of the circulation tower itself and the interior face and windows of the tower wall adapted as the gallery surface and then you could almost make uh, uh, make it out, you can see through the windows to the distant views through the tower windows. So in other words, uh, the views were incorporated um, by the project at the distant scale. Pairs of liquid crystal panels held a textual narrative, one part set within an existing window and the other adjacent to it. The pairs pulsated on and off at 10 second intervals and when the liquid crystal became translucent um, the surface text was legible, and when it became transparent, the view beyond was released. In the window panels, precise locations in the distance were pinpointed by a crosshair, and that was just another location chosen arbitrarily, either an apartment, office, hospital room, and occasionally a street scene. The adjacent panels featured surveillance video stills of each siding and, and the surface text described the object of observation witnessed through the pathological eye of an imaginary voyeur. Scene looking through southwest window from the third floor, excerpt. When he enters the room, he locks the door behind him and leans heavily against it. First, he slips out of his blue-green scrubs and he stands in front of the open closet and looks pensively into the mirror on the back of the door. There is a large discoloration under his left arm. With his arm raised above his head, he studies his upper body, rubbing the irregular bluish blot. Then he picks out a shirt, usually light blue, and buttons it in quick mechanical movements, then a tie, striped, usually. And then his starched white hospital coat. He sits with his back to the window in a high back leather and chrome swivel chair facing the door. Across his cluttered desk are two metal chairs which are repositioned every day symmetrically at slightly oblique angles. Sometimes he comes in early Sunday mornings when there is no one else around. 
He spends the day on the phone. It's black with a long coil cord, maybe nine or ten feet, twisted tightly at one end, relaxing to a soft figure eight at the bottom. He typically wedges the receiver between his shoulder and chin and paces in front of the desk, holding a cigarette in one hand, gesturing with the other. When he gets up from his chair, it pivots a quarter turn or more. Sometimes it comes back to a stop facing the window, exposing a large puncture on the leather back, where the stuffing is starting to come out. He fre frequently darts back to his desk to tip his ashes. When he sits, he twists the long coil cord around his hand, swiveling rhythmically in, in the armchair, 180 degrees to the right, 180 deg degrees to the left. Seen looking through northwest window from the second floor. Excerpt. The car turns right onto East Peterson from DeWitt Avenue and pulls up to the same spot three to four times a week. Only the right brake light wor works on, this ice, on the ice blue Pontiac sedan. It's not a standard GM color, lighter than baby blue and more intense than a pack of galois. The color of the right front fender and hood doesn't quite match the rest of the body. Orange pits of rust are visible on the driver's side. When the car comes down the street, an evergreen-shaped air freshener can be seen dangling from the rearview mirror. The car glides to a stop several yards from the no parking sign. He waits inside several minutes before turning off the engine. Then he slams the car door, double-checking the lock. Despite a slight limp, he walks briskly down the paved walkway toward the service entrance of the apartment building. He re reappears several, several minutes later, carrying a cardboard carton, bulging at the sides, secured around the edges with packing tape. The carton appears to be heavy, judging by his short, choppy steps. He quickly returns to the car, stepping over the white chain divider, cutting across the grass. He opens the trunk and places the box inside. Then he makes three or four more trips, each time carrying back a similar carton, locking and unlocking the trunk every time. Some of the boxes are stained at the corners, greasy, dark brown discolorations. After he arranges the last box, he looks up and down the street before he returns to the driver's seat, then starts the engine. As he pulls away, an oily substance dripping from beneath the car leaves a shiny black stain on the asphalt. Seen looking through southeast window from the third floor. Excerpt. When she arrives every morning, she automatically flips, flicks the switch of her computer and places a paper bag at the corner of her desk. As soon as she sits down, she removes a small mass in a paper wrapper. She peels the paper off of a pastry or muffin, places it on top of the flattened wrapper, and begins to type at her keyboard. It disappears in small increments. She looks up periodically, takes a bite, wipes her fingers, and continues. Mid-morning, she typically removes a container from her attache case and empties the contents into her desk drawer. The drawer opens and closes continuously. Around midday, a messenger delivers a large paper bag with a bold orange and blue logo on the side. She signs for it, unpacks several cardboard carton uh, containers, and begins. Intermittently, she takes calls and pecks at the keyboard, licking her fingers clean every time. Her head and torso are static. Her left arm pivots between her desk and mouth. In the afternoon, she returns from coffee break with a bulky form shrouded in white napkins, which she stuffs into her left file drawer. The drawer is never fully shut. By seven, mostly everyone has cleared out of the office. She opens her attache case and pulls out a disc that she pops into the computer. Her fingers move so rapidly at the keyboard that they, that they appear to be a blur. Dinner arrives about 10, the same Chinese delivery boy every time. They chat, she pays, he nods and leaves. For hours, she tosses bones and bits of refuse into the trash bin as she works at the keyboard. Some evenings, she stays past two, always careful to leave before the cleaning people arrive. When she leaves, she stuffs the disc into her attache case and empties her trash bin into a receptacle in the adjoining office. The exhibition viewer looks through an actual window at an actual view, which is fictionalized by a text. But his or her gaze transgresses the exhibition surface into actual private sites. Looking at the installation constitutes looking voyeuristically through the window. (laughs) 
seen looking through southeast window from the second floor, excerpt. He waits for her every morning on the southeast corner of Fairbanks and Chicago avenues. He arrives early and buys a copy of the Tribune from the vending machine. His elevated arms are visibly strained as he positions the paper to obscure his face. Frequently, he cranes his neck to the right, looking up the avenue. She doesn't appear every day. When she does, she follows the same route, approaching the intersection from the east, always with her poodle on a long red retractable leash. When he spots her approaching, he locks his gaze. She has a sophisticated and slightly mannered air about her, like an aged movie star, quite tall, with unusually broad shoulders. Sometimes she appears flamboyant with excessive makeup, fiery red lipstick, and spike heels. Her gestures appear overstated. Her stride is precarious, landing each step with a slight wobble. The dog moves erratically, lurches forward, extending the leash some 15 feet, then stops. She never changes her pace, always moving with a swift, steady gait. As she catches up, the leash contracts. Then the dog lurches forward again. She stops at the same mailbox every time and meditatively watches the yellow stream of her dog's urine stain the sidewalk. Then, as if woken from a trance, she is propelled forward by the dog's quick yank. As she nears the intersection, he folds the newspaper in quarters, tucks it under his arm, and shoves his hands deep into his pockets, walking in her direction. As they pass, he, moves, he looks away. At the same time that the museum visitor engages the text and view, he or she interrupts the sight line of the live video camera in the inter intermediate surveillance zone. The viewer becomes the new object of the camera's gaze, displacing the position of optical control to other viewers be before monitors located at the stair landings. The installation contorted the panopticon model of the centered eye a paradigm of a disciplinary society to characterize more, slow, more closely a society of control, which has evolved new weapons. Control is considered an in indeterminate realm constantly being displaced. The common definition of loophole is a small opening in a wall to discharge firearms. The word loophole derives from the Middle English loop, to watch or peer, which suggests its second function, an opening in a wall to permit observation. Implicitly, a loophole weakens one system of defense, the wall, to yield to a stronger system, the firearm, or the defensive eye. The supplanting of physical by progressively immaterial forms of security has left the wall vestigial, a retired symbol of defense from an age in which conflict was thought primarily to be a spatial condition with vulnerable interiors, defensible boundaries, and external invaders. The legal term loophole, by analogy, identifies a weakness in a textual fortification, an omission or ambiguity in, in a contract or obligation that provides an opportunity for evasion of intent. Such faults are often skillfully intentional and undetectable. Generally, a loophole can be thought of as a fatal defect that leads to the destruction of a logic. At the stair landings, the surveillance images on the screen can be seen against the actual surveillance zones. However, as the twin installations in the nearly identical towers differ subtly, um, the cameras and monitors on the two sides, at the, on the two sites, were cross-wired so that the space seemingly before the viewer may have actually been on the opposite side of the building. The symmetry that w at once expressed the muscular authority of this military institution now served to disorient its new occupants. So the project operated within the vulnerabilities and accepted social contracts, slipping the scopic codes of public and private spaces. And <clears throat> some details, at the landings, the handrails held, progressively, uh, held progressive warnings from do not touch, uh, escalating to on that one, do not feel, to do not caress, to do not fondle, and do not lick. <laughs> um, all the sites under surveillance scrolled through each monitor, and the fragmented text on the handrails looped uh, an adjusted ad adage from seeing is 
believing what your reading is, believing what your, and so on, seeing. The illicit look is what has come to define 42nd Street. Skin flicks, girly magazines, adult videos, peep shows, striptease joints. 42nd Street has catered to, to the commodification of bodies available for view. To commercially revitalize this area, the city, New York City, and developers have put a concerted effort into sanitizing the image of 42nd Street. Quote, Rebecca Robertson, president of the 42nd Street Development Corporation. Times Square um, is just on the verge of making a comeback, and 42nd Street is a cancer on that revival. Timeline. In 1973, architect developer John Portman proposed a large-scale urban plan with a $150 million uh, hotel as its centerpiece. The dream crashed when he couldn't raise the money to finish his scheme. In February 1981, state and city officials announced the 42nd Street development, development Project designed by Johnson and Berge, which included four office towers on Broadway and 7th Avenue, the renovation of historic theaters and construction of a wholesale trademark and hotel on 8th Avenue. Between 1984 and 1992, key tenants pulled out of the deal, despite the fact that the city overcoming 50 lawsuits managed to condemn a majority of extant buildings and evict most of the existing tenants from the area. Excerpt, New York Times, August 3rd, 1992. Governor Mario Cuomo. It's obvious that real estate is overdeveloped for the time being, so it doesn't make sense to go forward with the office, office towers. There's no market for them. To hold these people to the contract is to ask them to commit an act of economic self-mutilation. Between 1989 and 1991, the police were sent to restore law and order. Quote, they really cleaned up the block, said one of the owners of Peepland, where naked women still dance in the basement. He spoke on condition of anonymity because he said his business still bears a stigma. While he agreed that 42nd Street needed sprucing up, the owner argued for a simpler approach, planting trees and shrubs, along the sidewalk and painting all the storefronts the same color. He protested when asked if the old 42nd Street was as sleazy as some remember it. Uh, quote, let's use, another, let's use other adjectives, he said, pausing in the middle of emptying hundreds of golden tokens from one video booth. Exciting, mystifying, adrenaline-causing, razzmatazzy, spiffy. He caught himself. No, he said, forget spiffy. Little came out of the sweep. Since 1990, over two-thirds of 42nd Street has been boarded up and derelict with no relief in sight. Excerpt, New York Times, August 9th, 1992. In a mere two years, city and state developers hoping to remake the blocks have turned this once fevered, sleepless stretch of fast food joints, porn shops, offices and theaters into a veritable ghost town in the heart of Manhattan. In 1993, the Urban Development Corporation, who owns the titles to the buildings, unveiled a new interim plan to rehabilitate existing stores into shops and restaurants and theaters into rock palaces and entertainment centers. Architect Robert A.M. Stern was hired. His scheme recreated an enhanced nostalgic honky-tonk image of 42nd Street, piling buildings upon signs with what Stern calls, quote, a sense of threat, excitement, and daring do. In February 1993, <coughs> I'm sorry, in the uh, summer of 1993, a New York-based arts organization was asked by the Urban Development Corporation to install art into the derelict storefronts. It was believed that art could dispel the negative associations with the site and attract culture seekers, which would attract retailers seeking a new market, which would be the future clients for the Stern scheme. And that's where we come in. Soft Cell is an installation into uh, the entrance of the Rialto Theater, presently an abandoned porno theater off of 7th Avenue. The project takes issue with the production of desire in relation to the old and new forms of urban currency specific to 42nd Street. Currency such as bodies, real estate, and tourist commerce. 
Using one of the familiar mechanisms of seduction, the female mouth recites a chain of solicitations to passers-by. <laughs> Could we have the tape, please? I'm going to play a short segment of this. <coughs> hey, you. Want to buy a classic timepiece? Hey you, want to buy a pair of tickets behind home plate? Hey you, want to buy something for nothing? Hey you, want to buy a vacant lot in Midtown? Hey you, want to buy a second chance? Hey you, Want to buy an authentic, original, only one of its kind? Hey you, want to buy some motherly love? Hey you, want to buy an Ivy League education? Hey you, want to buy a ticket to paradise? Hey you, want to buy your name in lights? Hey you, want to buy a new suit that makes you look important? Hey you, want to buy a rare opportunity? Hey you, want to buy a left kidney? <laughs> hey you, Want to buy a judge? Hey you, want to buy a turbocharged five-speed souped-up shiny red muscle car? <laughs> hey you, want to buy a vowel? <laughs> hey you, want to buy a place in heaven? Hey you, want to buy a one-year subscription? Hey you, want to buy an all-you-can-eat diet plan? <laughs> hey you, want to buy a state-of-the-art, high-fidelity, satisfaction-guaranteed, new and improved model? Hey you, Want to buy yourself some more time? Hey you, want to buy a brand new baby boy? Hey you, want to buy that special feeling? Hey you, want to buy a new identity? Hey you, Want to buy an unobstructed view of the skyline? Hey, you. Want to buy a timeshare at the beach? Hey, you. Want to buy a memory of a lifetime? Hey, you. Want to buy a system upgrade? Hey, you. Want to buy a head start in life? Hey you, want to buy yesterday's charm with tomorrow's comfort? Hey you, want to buy the answer to your prayers? Hey you, want to buy a one-way ticket out of here? Hey you, Want to buy a hot tip? Hey you, 
Want to buy the latest sensation? Hey you, want to buy a set of encyclopedias with a four color atlas? Hey you, want to buy a new body? Hey you, want to buy some fatherly advice? Hey you, want to buy a building permit? Hey you, want to buy a piece of the American dream? Okay, I think. Hey you, want to buy picture. a souvenir to show your friends and family? Okay, can we get the projector going again? So uh, it's very strange because the, uh, the audience, which we clearly couldn't control because they were straight off the street, um, unpredictably began to respond to these questions. And they talked back to the screen all the time. <laughs> um, now, this voice emanated from um, the original speak hall. You could see the ticket booth to the right. Uh, and there was a speaker in front of the speak hall. I think I have a detail. All right. Um, the project um, also uh, interprets the peep show, um, another device of enticement associated with the site, in order to attract viewers from the street and lure them into a closer look at desire itself. And each of the uh, four door panels is labeled with an adjective commonly considered to be of negative value. Uh, the first one says shameless, then sinful, savage, and scandalous. Each word is just as comfortable on 42nd Street selling flesh as it is on Fifth Avenue selling luxury merchandise such as chocolates, fast cars, and perfume. Here the use of base values by popular advertising plays into our culture's moral conjunction of pleasure with degeneracy. Um, a liquid crystal panel is mounted on each of the four doors. And as the liquid crystal goes transparent, portions of this large image intermittently drop away to permit limited visual access just beyond the glass. And each window reveals a box voided of the promised object of desire and simply displaying another single word slogan and these use an inverse strategy, adjectives of moral principle used by advertising to sell excess. So here is discreet, innocent, genteel, virtuous. The oscillation of slogans to either side of the glass is further convoluted by the representation of each word in a typeface typically associated with its converse. excerpt from the 1932 musical 42nd Street. I'm here for only one thing, the money. Excerpt from the movie The Taxi Driver, uh, 1976. And speaking about the site. Travis, all the animals come out at night. Whores, skunk pussies, buggers, queens, fairies, dopers, junkies, sick, venal, Sometime a real rain will come and wash all the scum off the streets. Excerpt quoted from a male prostitute. We bring a lot of tourists to this area. If not for us, this town would be dead. Uh, could you change the carousel, please? Excerpt from a 1985 real estate study conducted by City College Graduate Center. The demand for drugs and commercial sex creates street markets that are not about to simply disappear. A handsome profit is extracted from 42nd Street's rundown property. A real estate broker described it as, quote, an ugly cow that gives a lot of milk. 42nd Street has always been defined by reversible values, an unsightly tourist site in which the friction between decadence and delight produces a meeting ground of conflicting par uh, patronage where, according to the lyrics of the theme song for 42nd Street, the underworld can meet the elite. It's a market in which successive forms of currency continually supplant one another, where high society entertainment,
gave way to cabaret society at the turn of the century, which gave way to the movie industry in the late 20s, which gave way to popular amusements in the 50s, which gave way to overt marketing of flesh and drugs in the 60s, which will give way to real estate and fashionable merchandise in the 90s. Each time, the desire-producing apparatus adapts to accommodate and maintain the new currency. The sustenance of the object of desire, however, is dependent on the object's indefinite deferral and ultimate absorption into the mechanisms of its own production. Regarding new anti-nudity legislation, to identify what falls under the category of indecent public exposure, the state of Florida produced a legal definition of the buttocks. <laughs> the buttocks was designated as the, rear, uh, the area at the rear of the human body which lies between two imaginary lines running parallel to the ground when a person is standing. <laughs> the first or top of such line drawn at the top of the cleavage of the nates, i.e. the prominence formed by the muscles running from the back of the hip to the back of the leg, and the second or bottom such line at the lowest visible point of the cleavage or the lowest point of the curvature of the fleshy protuberance, whichever is lower, <laughs> between two, and between two imaginary lines on each side of the body which run perpendicular to the ground and to the horizontal lines described above and which perpendicular lines are drawn through the point at which each nate meets the outer side of each leg. Any exposure of flesh within this rectangular boundary would be a legal infraction. Unlike land law, where property lines protect the space of the private from transgressions of the public, the property lines that define the socially decent body defend public space from transgressions of the, of the private or the privates. The play between property and propriety or the proper is particularly intricate in considering the body as a legal site. But the body has long been a site of questionable jurisdiction from Kafka's Harrow inscribing the crime against the state onto the body of the accused, to William Buckley's proposal to legally mandate all homosexuals testing positive for HIV to have their buttocks tattooed. Even more insidious are invisible markings onto social bodies. Take, for example, the production of bodies by disciplinary technologies and techniques of power, discussed by Foucault. Here, bodies are inseparable from institutional structures. They are docile and instrumentally encoded at the most minute levels, like the body of the soldier, for example. His every gesture is given a form and duration from posture to penmanship and invested with as much representational value as the uniform on his body. But bodies, as we know, are constructed by subtler mechanisms of control, like the fashionable body produced by popular media. This body is continually being reinscribed, reinscribed by a complex weave of dis discourses, including health, beauty, economy, and geography. For this project, uh, I'm especially interested in the body produced by a specific economic ideology. At the end of the 19th century, uh, the body was starting to be considered as a mechanical component of industrial productivity, an extension of the factory apparatus. Scientific management, or Taylorism, sought to rationalize and standardize the motions of the body, harnessing its dynamic energy and converting it into efficient labor power. According to Anson Rabenbach in The Human Motor, the dynamic language of energy was central to many utopian, and, uh, utopian social and political ideologies of the 20th century, Taylorism, Bolshevism, and fascism. All of these movements viewed the body both as a productive force and as a political instrument whose energies could be sub subjected to scientifically designed systems of organization. It was not too long before the practice of engineering bodies for the factory was introduced into the office, the school, and the hospital. And by the first decade of the 20th century, scientific management, this is much later, scientific management was brought into the home and applied to the domestic housework. And Housework is, in fact, the site of this inquiry. Time motion studies, which were developed to dissect every action of the fact factory laborer with the intention of designing ideal shapes of movement and ultimately the ideal laborer, were imported into the home to scrutinize every movement exerted in housekeeping in order to produce, ultimately, the ideal housewife. And the term housewife, though already in use in Europe since the 13th century, 
required the reconceptualization of both house and wife in relation to the servantless middle-class American household of the 1920s. Uh, the body of this housewife was interpreted by scientific management as a dynamic force with unlimited capacity for work. <laughs> Her only enemy was fatigue, and fatigue, in broader terms, undermined the moral imperative of the new social reform, the reclamation of all waste as usable potential. Excerpt from Hazel Thompson's Thresholds to Adult Living, uh, early 1950s. Pre-cooked foods made possible by new packaging developments are a major time saver for housewives. Notice the difference in time and effort required in the preparation of a pre-cooked, pre-packaged goulash dinner and one fixed entirely from scratch. Now, this, is the, this is the pre-packaged one, sorry. Can I go back? What a difference. Okay. So lights attached to the cook's wrists show how many more movements she had to make in the 90 minutes it took the long way compared with a pre-cooked way, which took only 12 minutes. Um, when Frank Gilbreth raised the efficiency of bricklaying by the reduction of stooping, Christine Frederick, the earliest exponent of scientific efficiency in the home, asked, didn't I, with hundreds of women, stoop unnecessarily over kitchen tables, sinks, and ironing boards as bricklayers stoop over bricks? Excerpt from Esther Bratton's study, Oxygen Consumed in Household Tasks. <laughs> Reaching with the arms to heights of 46 inches, 56 inches, and 72 inches above the floor requires an increase of oxygen consumed per minute over simply standing of 12%, 24%, and 50% respectively. The energy consumed is therefore in proportion to the height of the reach. Reaching up with the arms takes less energy than bending the body. Reaching by means of a trunk bend to 22, to 22 uh, inches and to 3 inches above the floor increases oxygen consumption above that required for standing to 57% and 131% of cubic centimeters of oxygen per minute. Reaching by using a knee bend to 3 inches above the floor requires 224% oxygen consumption. While this would indicate that a trunk bend requires less energy than a knee bend, the knee bend is believed to, to involve less muscular strain. The application of labor-saving techniques from scientific management, in conjunction with the introduction of household appliances, the new electric servants, sought to conserve the physical expenditure of the housewife in the 1920s. The time and ener energy saved, according to the rhetoric of efficiency, would release the woman from the home and thus enable her to join the paid labor force. The drive for efficiency, however, did not fulfill its liberating promise. Efficiency was often taken as an objective in itself. Ironically, it condemned the housewife to an increased workload as the expectations and standards of cleanliness in the home rose to compulsive levels. The discovery of the household germ and the proliferation of germ theory galvanized a link between dirt and disease. Dirt soon became a moral construct, yielding sexual, religious, and aesthetic distinctions. The fetishization of hygiene blurred the problem of cleanliness with beauty, chastity, piety, and modernity. Efficiency targeted domestic space as much as the domesticated body or the domestic body. The design of, interior, uh, of the interior succumbed to a paranoid hygiene. The dust and germ breeding intricacies of 19th century space soon collapsed in, into pure surface white, smooth, flat, non-porous, and seamless, under the continuous disciplinary watch of the housewife. Despite the unrealized aspiration of scientific, management applica scientific management's application to housework for the liberation of the housewife, daily work in the home continued to become increasingly rationalized by the women condemned to stay there. In order to remove the stigma from what was considered to be service-oriented menial labor of the female, Phyllis Palmer in Domesticity and Dirt argues that daily housework between the 1920s and 40s was progressively masculinized and reconfigured into a more comprehensive economic management of the household. Home economics now combined the skills of the nutritionist, the doctor, the accountant, the child care specialist, the informed consumer, among others. But despite this new characterization, the actual physical labor involved in housework remained just as demanding and distasteful as it had ever been. 
the dirt previously absorbed by the body of the servant was now a direct concern to the woman of the house. In the servantless household of the first half of the century, the maintenance, maintenance of the idealized female body that exhibited no evidence of dissolution had become a project of devotion equal to that of the maintenance of idealized domestic space. Both were dedicated to preventing the corrosions of age and to the daily restoration of an ideal order whose standards and values were produced and sustained in the public media, uh, in, the, in the popular media. Um, nowadays, home and body maintenance have found a new conjunction. Household chores can be incorporated into a daily aerobic regimen and performed to the beat of a television fitness trainer. No longer socially isolated, the homemaker can perform household tasks with countless other homemaker viewers. Even though housework is slowly becoming less gendered and the discrete categories of work and leisure sites are in flux, most conventions of domestic maintenance remain unchallenged. Housework's primary activities of managing dirt and restoring daily order continued to be subjected to the economic ethos of industry, guided by motion economy principles designed by efficient efficiency engineers. Excerpt from the 1962 Manual of Good Housekeeping, Chapter 16, Ironing Procedure, The Shirt. Center the back of the shirt on an ironing board with yoke taut. Lifting the iron as little as possible, draw the iron with its point facing the collar down the yoke to the rear tail hem and press the box pleat using unhurried, well-directed ryth uh, rhythmic motions. To avoid unnecessary manipulation of the garment, rotate the shirt in the following sequence. First counterclockwise over the ironing surface to expose the left front panel. Press. Pause when pressing each buttonhole and pocket, allowing the steam to penetrate the fabric facing an inner band. Next, rotate the shirt clockwise to expose the right front panel and press, rotating the, the tip of the iron around every button. Slide the right shoulder yoke over the tip of ironing board and press. Repeat with the left shoulder yoke. Lay out the right sleeve with the placket facing up and iron diagonally across the sleeve with from the underarm seam joint to the upper edge of the right of the sleeve cuff, pressing in a sharp crease. Repeat this procedure for the left sleeve. With the rear yoke centered, press the under collar and collar crease, working the sole plate toward the collar tips. Turn the shirt over with its front facing up and fasten the buttons. Using the Z method to eliminate unnecessary movements of the garment and arms, <laughs> turn the shirt over. Fold the rear facet in toward the center, pressing in a sharp crease from the outer edge of the yoke shoulder, two and one half inches out from the under collar seam to the tail hem. Fold the left sleeve 45 degrees at the shoulder seam so that the length of the sleeve runs parallel along the length of the rear facet crease and press. Repeat this procedure for the right rear facet and right sleeve. Fold the shirt tail one third of the way toward the collar. Fold one third over again to the yoke, ensuring that all edges are aligned and form 90 degree corners. Using the Z method, turn the shirt over and with its front facing out, press lightly. Um, boredom is part of the strategy of this talk. Um, the task of ironing is governed by minimums, uh, and they're both aesthetic and economic. A minimum of effort is used to reshape the shirt through a minimum of flat facets into a two-dimensional repetitive unit which will consume a minimum of space and this shirt will exhibit a minimum of creases on the body, particularly in the exposed area between the, lapels of the uh, between the lapels of the jacket. The standardized ironing pattern of a man's shirt habitually returns the shirt to a flat rectangular form which fits economically into orthogonal systems of storage. At the site of manufacture, the factory press shirt is stacked and packed into rectangular cartons which are loaded as cubic volume onto trucks and transported to retail space where the shirt's rectangular form is reinforced in orthogonal display cases. And then after purchase, 
sustained in the home, uh, on closet shelves or in dresser drawers, and finally on trips away from home in suitcases. The shirt is disciplined um, at every stage to conform to an unspoken social contract. When worn, the residue of the orthogonal logic of efficiency is registered on the surface of the body. <laughs> the parallel creases and crisp square corners of a clean pressed shirt have become sought after emblems of refinement. This byproduct of efficiency has become a new object of its desire. But what if the task of ironing would free itself from the aesthetics of efficiency altogether? Perhaps the effects of ironing could more aptly represent the post-industrial body by trading the image of the functional for that of the dysfunctional. Bad press. Instructions for an alternative ironing. <laughs> shirt one. With the left front panel of the shirt over the ironing surface, pull the iron tip uh, from the outer edge of the shoulder seam in a straight diagonal line down the fifth to the fifth or sixth buttonhole, depending on the inner lapel angle of the jacket to be worn. Repeat this procedure for the right panel and press only the area inside the V. <laughs> press the collar crease, working the sole plate toward the front collar tips. Press the exposed two inches of the shirt cuffs only. Button the front and lightly press a sharp crease into the left and right V edges. Um, the English dandies of the 18th and 19th centuries introduced the conception of personal cleanliness. The white shirt was introduced as a washable, socially accepted layer of covering between underwear and outerwear. It represented a new sanitary order. Beau Brummel is said to be responsible for the startling innovation of wearing a clean shirt daily. Excerpt from Zia Fratz, The Unseemliness of the Fashionable. According to the social gentility of dandyism, the white layer covering the skin always extended beyond the edges of the overgarment at the wrists and neck, serving as a sanitary frame for the obsessively well-groomed hands and head. The detachable collar and cuffs were thus subjected to the most rigorous boiling, starching, ironing, and polishing. What was initially meant to represent a new austerity in dress for men, the great masculine renunciation, returned into a fascination with artifice which transformed the image of sobriety into the image of flamboyant efficiency. Shirt two. Press the shirt according to ironing procedure but do not fold. With the shirt facing up, fasten the second button into the first buttonhole at the collar. Continue fastening the buttons in sequence, skipping the fourth buttonhole. The remaining buttons will fall into alignment. Turn the shirt over and press the left and right facets. Adjust for material discrepancy by skewing the right shoulder ridge and midfold to seven degrees from the horizontal median. <laughs> um, prisoners assigned to laundering detail in a state correctional facility have invented a highly developed language art articulated through the practice of ironing. Seemingly superfluous decorative creases pressed into the clothing of other prisoners are invested with representational value understood only to the initiated. Like the prison tattoo, another form of inscription on a soft, pliable surface, the crease is a mark of resistance by the marginalized. But where the tattoo acts on the only possession left to the prisoner, the skin, the crease acts directly on the institutional skin of the prison uniform. It's a kind of camouflage defacing. The crease resists appropriation more so than the tattoo in that its abstract language is indecipherable compared to the typically pictorial language of the tattoo. Shirt three. Press the shirt flat. Keeping the back panel facing up, use standard ironing procedure folding the right sleeve over the right facet. Keep the left sleeve free, continue to press, folding the shirt along the axis of the right sleeve to reduce the shirt to precise width of the front pocket. Fold the collar forward at a 45 degree angle to the shirt. Fold the right sleeve in half along its length and press. Cross fold and bring the right sleeve up through the collar and with a crease five inches from the cuff, tuck down, tuck down into the pocket. Excerpt from the Journal of Behavioral Research and Therapy, citing the case of a 38 year old school teacher being treated for an obsessional compulsive disorder. When patient X began ironing an article of clothing, 
She could not stop un until she collapsed from exhaustion. The patient would meticulously and without pause press out the most imperceptible wrinkles in a shirt, for example, repeating the same areas over and over again. The wrinkles could never be completely removed, thus the job could never be properly finished according to her expectations, as new wrinkles would inevitably be introduced into the garment by the task of ironing itself. <clears throat> shirt four. Press the shirt without folding. Button the cuffs and front panels of the shirt, push the collar into the shirt from the top, and pull it out between the fourth and fifth buttons. Fold the cuffs back onto themselves and iron flat. Pull the cuff through the collar, keeping the crease axis at 45 degrees. Fold the collar over and down, press the left and right facets, and press perpendicular folds before the third, and, third button and after the sixth. Excerpt from the New York Times, December 30th, 1993, headline. Low iron 100% cotton shirts from Japan expected in the United States by Father's Day. <coughs> when cotton is worn and washed, this is just an excerpt here, when cotton, cotton is worn and washed, the hydrogen bridges that connect the cellulose molecules in cotton can break. If bridges break, the molecular chains swell and shift upon washing and wrinkles form. However, when cotton is treated with resins and other reactive molecules, New bridges are formed between cotton molecules, which stabilize the fabric. Short scientists, as it turns out, have a scale for classifying wrinkles, with one being the equivalent of a withered prune and five being like steel. The new shirts have a rating between 3.5 and 4.0. In Japan, where domestic chores are still divided largely along traditional gender lines, the shirts are proving popular not only with housewives, who hate to iron, but also with salary men, who on business trips can now wash a shirt in the sink, hang it up to dry, and wear it the next day. Certainly the popularity of permanent press miracle fabrics among Japanese businessmen is based as much on saving physical labor as it is on maintaining the image of labor expended by their wives. Excerpt from the popular game show, The Family Feud, MC. This is popular here? No. <laughs> okay. Um, from the MC, listen carefully to this question. We asked 100 married men, name one of the first warning signs that a marriage is going on the rocks. The top six answers are on the board. Perhaps the advent of miracle fabrics, um, uh, in, in the advent, perhaps the ironing will continue uh, to linger as a sign of affection. Anyway, shirt five. Press the right sleeve with a crisp crease down the center. Turn the left sleeve inside out. Press and pull the sleeve through the button collar. Extend one hand through the inside of the right sleeve and placket end and grasp the shirt bottom at the front bands. Gather the shirt completely into the right sleeve until the collar meets the underarm seam. Align the collar and cuff with the vertical crease of the sleeve. Two speculations on the fold. John Reichman. One cannot say that the fold or plea uh, is traditional to philosophy, though etymologically it is parent to many fold words words with plic or, and plex, like explication, implication, multiplicity and perplexity, complexity or perplication and complication. The fold involves an affective space. The modernist machines for living sought to express a clean, efficient space for the new mechanical body. But who will invent a way to express the affective space for the new multiplicitous body? And Greg Lynn says, Culinary theory has developed a definition for three types of mixtures. The first involves the manipulation of homogeneous elements, beating, whisking, and whipping, change the volume but, did, but not the nature of the liquid uh, through agitation. The second mixes two or more disparate elements, chopping, dicing, grinding, grating, slicing, shredding, and mincing, eviscerate elements into fragments. The third, folding, creaming, and blending, mix smooth, smoothly multiple ingredients through repeated gentle overturnings in such a way that their individual characteristics are maintained. If there is a single effect produced in architecture by folding, 
It will be the ability to integrate unrelated elements within a new continuous mixture. A folded mixture is neither homogeneous like whipped cream nor fragmented like chopped nuts, but smooth and heterogeneous. Shirt six. Turn the shirt inside out and center on the ironing surface, pulling plackets taut. Evenly divide the back panel length into 20 sections. Fold each section over accordion fashion and firmly press. With the entire shirt back folded and pressed, roll it back into the collar, leaving left and right front panels extending from collar tips. Fold the collar over compressed shirt and fasten the collar buttons. Reverse the inside out sleeves over remaining side panels, fasten the cuffs and press. I'll just go through quickly a couple of others. Um, the fold has been a useful metaphor for the discourse of post-structuralist architecture because it consolidates ambiguities such as surface and structure, figure and organization. One of the prime attributes of the fold is that it is non-representational. The fold also implies reversibility. If it can be folded, it can be unfolded and refolded. The crease um, is a more compelling metaphor for us because it represents a resistance to transformation. The crease has a longer memory than the fold and it has representational value in the nature of an inscription. The crease is harder to get out. Its traces guide its continual conformation until a new social order is reinscribed with the illusion of permanence. Thank you. Okay, um, does anyone have any questions? It's kind of weird, suppose. No heckling, uh, tomatoes. <laughs> yes. What's the difference of fast project and final project, media and the shirts project? The, the media and the shirts project? Yeah. The difference, um, <laughs> I guess it, all the projects um, that we do are, are never very consistent in terms of uh, sites, uh, techniques, um, uh, and even uh, precisely subject matter. But um, I would say the resemblance is that both um, attempt to look at uh, something extremely obvious and conventional, something that's so obvious um, and ordinary that we've been blinded to it um, because of its, its normalcy. And I think that um, as a kind of general strategy to our work, um, we attempt to just simply look a little harder at those blind spots. So uh, if anything, I wouldn't attempt to, to, you know, to, to discuss the difference, but maybe just that, that similarity between the three projects. Uh, the, the difference in, in um, the, the one time that I, I, I uh, discussed this last project was in a, in a conference on technology and everybody was very disturbed that I brought in um, uh, ironing as a, as a technology uh, because people associated our work you know, previously with, with sort of slightly higher technologies. But, um, but it's our, and maybe it looks like a tremendous discrepancy, but actually um, uh, we're quite interested in um, not technology in the strict sense of, of wires and, um, and electronics, but in the kind of political and economic technologies which constitute our, um, you know, our, our social structures. So in that way, they're, they're related as, as technologies. Any other questions? Any other questions? <coughs> Are you trying to do for architecture? Burroughs and Dyson did for writing with the folding method, because like you've got the shirt thing folded, you've also got at the cut up, and you've also got like minimal space being exercised with the contextualized architecture elements. Uh, I'm are, you sorry. are you trying to do for architecture what Burroughs
<laughs> well, I never thought of, you know, uh, modeling our work after Burroughs, but that's a great association. I, I Edgar Rice, though. Oh, Edgar Rice. I thought you meant uh, <laughs> William. <laughs> well, I, you know. <laughs> Um, okay, I, I, I sort of don't, I don't remember the question, but <laughs> um, the, you know, the, the shirt is a, is, a, is a rhetorical project, you know, and in that way, it's, um, you know, it doesn't profess to, to um, prescribe anything at all, but rather through the sort of concern with inscription, it, it plays uh, into this kind of, um, I would say, uh, a kind of uh, strategy of description, right? To, to and, sh and, sh and short of prescription, right? So it's something, it's something between inscription and and, per and uh, description, and and trying to do so um, in a kind of non-passive way, you know, which description is normally thought of as, as passive and uncritical. So the the, the idea of the project is um, because simply we don't really mean to say that architecture will no longer no longer needs to be uh, orthogonal to house these weird shirts, nor are we saying that uh, necessarily, you know, this is a kind of fashion statement. But by um, sort of producing this, pr the pr this project rhetorically, um, we can um, sort of formulate um, the question about the relationship between the body uh, and folding in uh, uh, the issues of, of architecture and, uh, and uh, s social constructions of the body. No, actually, it's they're artifacts, and uh, they were presented in a couple of different places, uh, just uh, lined up in one place on ironing boards, and uh, yeah. Right. Um, is it? I mean, it strikes me as that. Yeah. Uh, the, the, f the first two projects are in a kind of first, uh, uh, in a kind of direct address mode. And I think in a certain way our projects are more prone in that direction. We rarely make um, artifacts that are, that are not um, engaged. So and Because uh, we wanted to. <laughs> why not? <laughs> I mean, why, why, why do we need to be consistent? <laughs> I mean, the, the <laughs> the, the project. No, 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 I, I didn't take it that way. The the project, in a way, was performative in its uh, in its production, you know, so that the way that it was engaged and the uh, sort of uh, filing of different uh, sort of patterns and directions and so forth, you know, we gone went through it uh, over and over and over again, videotaped and did all sorts of things. But actually, I, I would say the one aspect of the display, because our, our, our projects um, typically uh, are not rooted to the earth, because we, we don't get real commissions very often, but um, they're usually in the context of museum and gallery spaces, and always uh, there is some form of uh, very self-conscious uh, uh, understanding of that site and the rules and codes of that site. And in this particular case, uh, where it was exhibited was a, uh, a gallery that was once a sweatshop uh, in Loft District in Manhattan, and which is now a very fashionable yuppie area. So the one sort of condition that was, was very interesting in the end in the display of the shirts was that it um, couldn't ever forget that in fact the factory production was always present and latent in the site, and at the same time that it was very much like a boutique. So it was, you know, all three uh, uh, programs coincided at the moment. Oh, uh, you know, the same guy. The, yeah, yeah, culture mavens, people out on for the for Saturday shopping. You know, that. There's a question there, and then. Uh, I think that the, um, that's, a, that's a difficult question. Uh, the, 
when I said masculinized and th tried to define that, it was um, a kind of defensive uh, 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 kind of gesture. And in um, this kind of consuming practice, which involved everything um, in terms of the maintenance of the household, um, using that, that word and, and understanding the way that that uh, practice sort of advanced is a way that, that uh, let's say, housewives uh, were able to um, defend this practice for themselves, I think. Um, so even though, yes, it became, there was a whole change of uh, uh, social structures uh, f between the First and Second World Wars, and, and uh, following there was a completely uh, a new definition, a redefinition of, of housework. And I'm not so sure that things are really so different, and in fact the research, our research concludes that things aren't all that different in the end. Uh, they're just called different things. Um, I don't. Uh, I, I don't know exactly what feminizing an architecture would be. Um, um, I'm always a little bit nervous about casting um, my work and our work as feminist architecture. I don't really think of it that way. But um, in the end, I mean, there are many different feminisms, and part of the problem was that is that that the general a public uh, consideration of, of, of uh, feminism is a kind of a reductive, uh, kind of essentialist practice. And, and I would say in our work what we attempt to do is look at um, social constructs laterally, folding in a lot of different discourses, not only feminist discourse, mm -hmm. uh, but many different ones. And I'm not so sure um, the practice is being demasculinized or feminized, but maybe those terms aren't even so applicable to the kind of work that we're doing. And in that way, it doesn't, you know, become kind of a binary situation. Yeah. Um, I was extremely interested in your articulation of the difference between the crease and the fold. And essentially, you're choosing or aligning yourself with the crease because um, it recalls the inscriptive capabilities. And in fact, I think your work really goes a long way to show the degree to which there is a saturation of code. Um, but the fold and the, the work you were quoting from is an effort to look for spaces that somehow elude that degree of saturation and provide a new space for new possible uh, and yet unpredicted focus. And so when you choose sides, you're choosing sides in, in a very crucial architectural debate. Um, I, I, I suppose I am, and I don't believe that, I don't believe in newness, uh, and maybe that's uh, the, in newness and that um, it's possible to find a new space and to find uh, a space without codes. Um, I do think, however, that it's possible to rewrite and, and reinscribe. And, and maybe, you know, the work, <coughs> in a sense, is not prescriptive. It falls short in a certain way of our expectations also in, in prescribing uh, different kinds of space yet. I mean, we're still looking at things and situations. Um, but it... Um, is uh, at least foregrounding um, certain kinds of um, inv uh, invisible conditions where architecture has uh, been complicit in the sustenance of, of cultural conventions. And I think that architects aren't, um, at least they're not, uh, if, as far as we're concerned, con conscious enough of reading and understanding uh, the complexity of sites, uh, bodies, uh, programs, and so forth. And um, with a, a, a deeper and more profound reading of those conditions, I, I think that something maybe other than newness, but a, a kind of uh, a tr a transformation of, of those codes could, uh, could be brought out. But I, I, I agree with you. I mean, I d there's a purpose, purposeful, I mean, the, the, the thing about the argument of the fold, I mean, in a way is inserted into the project. I mean, it never really came uh, from a consideration of folding, but it's, it's hard to, to let that go. And in fact, it serves as a, as a perfect um, kind of model of, of the difference uh, through which we look at. More questions. Yeah. I was wondering if I could get copies of those slides, and did you draw any sections of the shirts? Because, uh, <laughs> <laughs> what do you need the copies of the slides for? <laughs> uh, we can negotiate. It depends on what, what, you're, what you're offering. Um, and it, did we, the, the sections, that it's, it, we did, in fact. We, when we, uh, the iron was one tool and, and um, the pencil was another tool and uh, 
many of the, you know, many of the thoughts, and I'm showing um, just a, a sort of excerpted section, but there are lots of them, and um, many of them came out of thinking about uh, reworking those those conventions of short folding and so forth. But some of them really just came off the drawing table, and so it, uh, the, the different ideas, I mean, there's no hierarchy there, there's just like a lot of different thoughts that just came from different places. I don't know how well priests they were, but they were great models for <laughs> That's what I was afraid of. <laughs> I should, <laughs> I just want to add a warning with this lecture, please do not make buildings that look like these shirts. <laughs> That's my responsibility as an educator. <laughs> okay, well, if there are no more questions, on your behalf, I'd really like to thank Elizabeth Diller for an enormous amount of pleasure. Thank well, you. Thank very you very much. much.